Okay, let's get started. So um, I'd like to start by first acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. My name is Catherine Somerville and I am the Senior Media and Communications Officer here at the Doherty Institute. Um, a reminder that this story is under embargo until 9pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time tonight the 19th of February. Please do not publish or broadcast this news until after that time. So just a really quick summary about um, why we're all here. Australian scientists have described the evolution of immunity levels up to four months following COVID-19 infection, finding that while antibody levels drop dramatically in the first one to two months, the decrease then slows down substantially. These findings suggest that protective COVID-19 vaccines should ideally generate stronger antibody responses than natural infection. The research team includes University of Melbourne, Dr. Jennifer Juno, a senior research fellow at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, Professor Miles Davenport, head of the Infection and um, Analytics Program at the Kirby Institute at the University of New South Wales, and Dr. Jingjing Wang from Flinders University, and they all, and they all join us today. Um, so each of them will provide a quick introduction about the work, um, and we will follow that by questions, which I will facilitate. So Dr. Juno, please go ahead. Thank you. So this is a follow up study to some work that we published last year, where we were aiming to understand the immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is the protein that allows the virus to bind to the cells and initiate an infection. So in this work, we followed 64 individuals over the course of four to five months after they had recovered from mild COVID-19 infection. And we tracked the evolution of a number of different immune responses. So we looked at the antibody levels in these individuals, we looked at the ability of those antibodies to inhibit SARS-CoV-2, and then we also looked at immune cells that are very important for protection from infection, and this includes T cells as well as B cells, which produce those antibodies. And what we found, as was mentioned before, is that a number of these immune responses do decline over time, as we would expect from the resolution of a viral infection. But interestingly, we found that the B cell frequencies that recognized the spike protein actually increased over time. So we saw an accumulation of these B cells in the majority of participants in our cohort, and we saw evidence that they might be evolving and further maturing over the course of this, uh, this time frame. So we're very excited to consider these results um, in the context of how these B cells might be protective from reinfection and what role they might play down the line. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the infection analytics team at the Kirby Institute at the University of New South Wales was involved in the analysis and modelling of the experimental data coming from the Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne and the Flinders Labs. We were interested in calculating the half-life of different immune responses as they declined after infection. We found, um, as Jen said, that the responses tended to decline more rapidly soon after infection and then become more stable. Then we went on to use these half-lives to develop a simulation to predict how long immunity might last under different assumptions. Thank you. So our team at Flinders University studied the molecular signatures of serum antibodies against spike protein, the actual final product in the body. We performed the words first method spectrometric sequencing of these protective antibodies and identified their specific barcode amino acid sequences coupled with a paired PCR sequencing performed by Dr. Whitley from the Doherty. The next question is, how does each individual clone change over time? We then performed the quantitative proteomics to track these clones by using the identified barcodes and found a decline in the abundance over time for each unique clonotype with a varied decay rate. This novel proteomic uh, technology developed at Flinders is spin off from our internationally acclaimed work on autoimmune diseases. Um, we are very uh, excited to use this method to track the durability of COVID vaccine responses. Thank you. Okay, so this is from Sonia Pemberton from Gene Pool Productions. I wonder if you are seeing anything with long, long COVID subjects. So that is an area of research, particularly um, that we have collaborators in Sydney who are very interested in long COVID, and there is ongoing work in that area. Uh, but again, the cohort that was under study here were generally individuals who had mild infection resolved uh, generally within about 30 days of, of symptom onset. So there are certainly studies underway in that area, but that does not really include this cohort. 
Uh, hi, yes, can you hear me? We can. Oh, good. Uh, thank you for putting on the presentation. I just want to understand the implications of the research for um, th this community transmission question that's come up, you know, how much community transmission are we expecting to see once we get a certain amount of vaccine out there? What, the, what are the implications of your research for that question, please? I think the, the the real interest in this work and its its relation to um, protection from from reinfection lies around you know after neutralizing antibodies decline, which as Miles described, they decline sort of within the first two to three months post infection. Um, we do see these other aspects of the immune system basically you know coming up and potentially providing added benefit to to increase that protective window, and that particularly we hope will be the case for the B cells that we described. So these are cells that that can produce antibodies that recognize the spike protein. And the fact that they continue to increase in numbers over time for at least the first four to five months after infection suggests that there are other arms of the immune system that may be important in protecting individuals from reinfection. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to, to study that in, in further detail. And we'll also be able to compare the results from this study to data coming out of the vaccine studies so that we can understand how the vaccine induced immune responses also affect to the B cell compartment. So hopefully that'll be an interesting avenue for further investigation. Um, can I ask another question too? Go for it. Yeah, I just wonder, as I'm seeing the, um, from a non-technical perspective, as I understand the research, it suggests it's early signs that the immune, immune, immunity is retained quite strongly. Um, and therefore that's a good indicator that as vaccines come out, we may also see similar sort of immunity. Is that a, a fair interpretation of, 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 the re, of the work? Yes, I think that's fair to say. So the, the cohort that we've looked at here, as I said, is, has recovered from mild infection. And the data that's coming out from the vaccine trials suggests that a number of vaccine candidates are inducing antibody and immune responses that are you know, more than two times higher from the vaccines than what we see in individuals who have recovered from infection. And, and Miles may want to speak a little bit further to that around some of the modeling, but I think the early indications suggest that the vaccines are, are definitely inducing an equally, if not more robust immune response than what we see here. And I think that does bode well. Yeah. Miles, did you want to add to that? Um, only to say that we, we don't know the detailed kinetics of the immune responses after vaccination yet, so we, we can't directly compare, but the fact that uh, for some of the vaccines you start with a stronger response to begin with is, is a good sign, I would say. Thanks. Um, and Sonia, again from Gene Pool Productions, just to clarify, can recovered patients assume they have sufficient protection without the vaccines? Unfortunately, at the moment, that is a, a very difficult question to provide a strong, you know, absolutely certain response to. Um, when we look at the rates of reinfection that we are being reported worldwide, it certainly seems that most individuals uh, remain protected from reinfection for an extended period of time. There's obviously a lot of interest in defining exactly what that window is, um, but we still, of course, encourage individuals uh, to receive the COVID vaccinations when they become available, regardless of whether they've been previously infected. Thanks. Um, now, Sally Coburn has joined us to ask another question. Go ahead, Sally. Uh, hello. And uh, oh, um, look at that. I've got my, my <laughs> thing up. Sorry. Um, thank you for your time. And thank you for doing this because there's so much noise out there. It's great to have um, experts like yourself, real experts, talking about your um, evidence-based findings. My question follows on from my other questions, which I'm sorry they were slightly off topic. But will you be including... Um, immunocompromised and autoimmune type people in your future studies. It's just, this is a huge group in general practice. I completely understand that. And I think it is really important to study those individuals. Uh, we're in a bit of a, a unique situation, I guess, uh, here in, in Melbourne and in Australia with the fact that we have, you know, relatively low community transmission at the moment, which is, uh, limiting the number of participants that we're able to recruit for these studies. So at this point in time, because they weren't involved in, in the original studies and the longitudinal study, um, we don't have members of those uh, groups in our cohort, uh, but I really do hope and support that in, in places with larger uh, opportunities to recruit ongoing infections, that that would be a focus of their work. 